Hello, and welcome to the Clinical Liver Diseases video series. CLD is an official digital learning publication of the ASLD. I'm Dr. Danielle Brandman, Associate Professor at UCSF and an Associate Editor with CLD. I'm here with Dr. Carlos Santos, Associate Professor at Rush and author of Breakthrough Hepatitis B Virus Infection in a Liver Transplant Recipient on Lamividine Prophylaxis for Donor Hepatitis B Core Antibody Seropositivity, a review of practices to prevent de novo hepatitis B virus infection after transplant, which will be published in CLD. Dr. Santos, thank you so much for joining us to discuss your manuscript. I read with interest your case of a patient who had undergone liver kidney transplant with organs from a donor who was hepatitis B coronabody positive, and this patient ultimately developed evidence of active hepatitis B four and a half years after transplant. I was hoping you could highlight for me the key learning points of this case that you really wanna make sure the reader takes away. Well, I think the most important thing to remember is that it can occur. I think that this has become so common for us, taking these organs that are at B core antibody positive, and we would start some antiviral prophylaxis, and we would kind of forget about it since liver transplant is complicated and a lot of other things happen. So that's one thing is that hepatitis B active infection can occur as a result of hep B core antibody seropositivity in the donor, and it reactivates in the recipient, and despite antiviral prophylaxis. So that's one. The second thing is we do try to prevent this from happening. And in our case, we initially started in Tecavir, but then because of insurance problems, it got changed to lamivudine because it's something like $11,000 cheaper for the insurance company to cover lamivudine. So she was changed over and then several months later developed breakthrough hepatitis B and it was resistant to lamivudine. So I think that's another learning opportunity is that to know that lamivudine uh, is associated with breakthrough hepatitis B infection and may not be first line. However, cost effectiveness um, uh, prevents us from always using alternative therapies. So that's the second learning opportunity is that in the real world, uh, we are using lamivudine and that breakthrough occurs. The third learning opportunity I would say is that there are alternatives. And so there's tenofovir alafenamide, uh, TDF or entecavir, but then insurance needs to sign off on it. And the fourth learning opportunity is that vaccination is important and that if our recipient had been vaccinated pre-transplant, this may not have occurred. So I would say those are the key learning opportunities. Yeah, thank you. I think those are really important points. Um, and I think really speaks to the need for us to be you know, aggressive in our recommendations for hepatitis B vaccination for our patients um, that we're seeing in their earlier stages of disease, since you mentioned that you know, patients like this one who was older and had metabolic syndrome comorbidities may not necessarily mount a response to the vaccine later in life. Um, now, one thing I was wondering about was um, in the case you mentioned this patient had about a 15 month lapse um, in lab data. Um, and I just wanted to hear, you know, how certain were you that the patient was actually taking um, the medications? And so the pharmacy refills were appropriate. And so it really seemed like she was uh, getting refills at the appropriate time. And so that certainly not an assurance. Uh, we don't have complete proof, but it does point to adherence to therapy. Right. Um, now, I know our patients are often worried about receiving organs that they view as imperfect, um, particularly if that imperfection involves risk of infection, as with hepatitis B coronabody positive livers. 
Now, did this case in particular and your review of the existing literature, you know, change the way that you advise our transplant team in counseling patients about this category of core positive livers? And so we always counsel our patients about the risks of accepting these organs. And specifically for hepatitis B, we do counsel patients that there's a risk of infection but that those risks could be mitigated with antiviral therapy or immunization. Um, it's also very important to remember not to forget to surveil for these hepatitis B infections, which I think in the end was uh, what saved the patient. Uh, active infection occurred, but there was no hepatitis yet, and so the allograft was not harmed. And we were able to change over to tenofovir alafenamide, and the viral load is now undetectable. Excellent. Well, I'm really glad to hear that this case ultimately had um, a good ending um, and very thankful that we do have safe, effective antiviral therapy. Um, any final thoughts about this case? I think that liver transplantation is life-saving. And uh, in the time of COVID, uh, we realize that life is even more important. So I think that transplant should continue to occur and that we could do them safely. We, not without some misadventures from time to time, uh, as in this case with breakthrough hepatitis B, but we were able to surveil for it and manage the patient effectively with TAF and the patient is now doing well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Santos. And thank you for joining us for another installment uh, in the clinical liver uh, disease video series. And thank you to the audience for joining us. On behalf of all of us on the CLD team, I hope you found this interview useful. For more information about hepatitis B infection and liver transplant, please visit www.cldlearning.com. Thanks again for watching. Thank you.